It is evident that the conflict is now seriously escalating. There are also reports of confrontations and a heavy federal military buildup around Wakimra and um, northern Amhara. Kenya's presidential election petition hearing continues today Friday with a presentation from Elections Commission lawyers. Increasing demands for Nigeria's oil company to prove allegations that churches and officials are stealing crude oil. It reports there's 374 academic programs offer at the University of Ghana are not accredited. Malawi shuts down grain marketing agency over corruption. Abuse of company finances and theft by some employees. Low productivity contributed to laziness of some company employees. And thousands of children in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel may die from severe malnutrition and waterborne diseases. Those stories plus something O'Malley sports are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Tigrayan rebels in Ethiopia say government forces and troops from neighboring Eritrea have launched a coordinated offensive as fighting intensifies in the region. Henry Wilkins reports from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. On Thursday, a spokesperson for the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front said on Twitter that Eritrean forces have joined Ethiopian federal forces in the fight against the TPLF. Getachew Raider said the forces launched what he called a massive four-pronged offensive early Thursday in the Adyabo area of northwestern Tigray, adding that TPLF forces are defending their positions. A later statement by the Tigray military command said planes belonging to Ethiopian airlines are being used to transport military personnel and supply munitions to troops in the north. There has been no independent confirmation of the TPLF accusations. An Ethiopian government spokesperson and the Eritrean Ministry of Information did not respond to a request for comment. In their own statements, Ethiopian officials have accused the TPLF of launching attacks in Amhara this week. Bloomberg News reports that Ethiopia's foreign minister told diplomats Thursday that the government is taking measures against Tigrayan forces while trying to avoid civilian casualties. William Davison is an analyst with the International Crisis Group, a research institution based in Belgium. Now, um, Tigrayan reports, um, which seem to be accurate of a large-scale um, incursion into Tigray from the north by Eritrean um, and federal forces. So uh, it is evident that the conflict is now seriously escalating. There are also reports of confrontations and a heavy federal military buildup around Wakimra and um, northern Amhara, um, a little bit to the west of, of, of southern Tigray, where the fighting started. So another indication that the uh, the fighting is, is widespread and uh, possibly of a major new front. Eritrea is a long-time opponent of the TPLF, which effectively ruled Ethiopia from 1991 to 2018. Fighting between Tigrayan fighters and pro-Ethiopian government forces resumed in northern Ethiopia a week ago, ending a five-month ceasefire. As a result, the UN has stopped humanitarian aid deliveries to Tigray, where relief groups say parts of the region are likely in a state of famine. Henry Wilkins for VOA News, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Kenya's Supreme Court today continues its hearing of a petition challenging the election of William Ruto. Today, Friday, the Electoral Commission's legal team makes the first presentation. The judges, led by Chief Justice Martha Kumi, are expected to render a ruling on Monday, September 5th. At the same time, the U.S. Embassy in Kenya has issued a travel advisory to its citizens ahead of the ruling. Maureen Ojiambo reports from Nairobi. The Supreme Court of Kenya is considering electoral petitions to overturn elections. In some of the affidavits, the Azmiya Domoja One Kenya coalition is insisting that the elections be nullified and fresh elections held without the IEBC chairperson of Fulache Bukati. He is accused of manipulating the vote. Former Attorney General Gidu Mugai, who was admitted at the hearings as a friend of the court, says removing Chebukati from the offices is constitutionally difficult. 
It is said that he should be removed from office and forbidden from ever holding public office. And I want to ask my learned colleagues for the petitioners, is that really a serious submission when the Constitution itself contains complex processes of the removal of a person he is now to be removed here by reference to affidavits of hearsay on the back of hearsay? On the other hand, lawyer Fred Ngatia representing President-elect William Ruto said that the petitioner's continuous threats against Chibukate may lead the country to a crisis. My petition, apart from being contradictory, would take this country to a constitutional crisis because the petitioner has repeatedly said he will not participate in an election held by IEBC under the chairmanship of Shebukati. Yesterday, the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi issued a security alert advising its citizens against traveling to Kisumu ahead of Monday's Supreme Court verdict. In a statement, the embassy stated that Kenya has experienced continuous violence after the election. Reporting for VA's Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Jumbo in Nairobi, Kenya. The government of Malawi has suspended services of the National Grain Marketing Agency, the Agriculture Development and Marketing Corporation, or ADMARC, over allegations of... corruption, theft, and abuse of office. All workers have been sent on an indefinite pay leave with only a skeleton staff in areas hard hit by food shortages. But critics say the move is too harsh for an entity used by Malawians to buy cheaper agricultural commodities, including the main food crop, maize. Lamek Masina reports from Blantayo. Agriculture Minister Robin Lowe told at a revised press conference Wednesday that the suspension aims to bring sanity to the cooperation he said was full of management flaws. Abuse of company finances and theft by some employees. Low productivity contributed to lessness of some company employees. Suspected corrupt practices by some employees of the company and procedural recruitment of some employees leading to excess workforce in the company. In May, the government ordered the suspension of its general manager, Rhino G. Pico, for purchasing an official vehicle worth 107,000 US dollars without approval from the board of directors. In June, the parliament forced Admark to cancel its plans to sell about 100,000 metric tons of maize to Zimbabwe, saying the process it used to reach the deal did not follow proper procedures. Lowe hopes the restructuring which will follow will help redefine the functions of the cooperation so that it can better save the public. Lowe said a skeleton staff of the agency will remain saving Malawians in areas had hit by food shortages. The Malawi Vulnerability Assessment Committee shows that nearly 4 million Malawians are facing food insecurity largely because of the effects of Tropical Storm Anna and Cyclone Gombe. However, agriculture experts have faulted the government for shutting down ADMAC. Henry Kamkwamba is a lecturer of agriculture policy and econometrics theories at the Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. He told VOA the suspension will negatively impact farmers who are supposed to be selling their produce to ADMAC. If they hold commodities uh, for a long time, uh, that uh, is going to result in an increase in storage costs, which the farmer is supposed to bear. And uh, in marketing, an increase in, in storage cost is very costly uh, for uh, the producers. And eventually, this might be pushed on to consumers. And uh, we might expect that some of the essential commodities that Admax sells, uh, there might be an increase uh, in their prices. Kankwamba doubts if the government move to restructure the organization will help it regain its reputation. There has been no glory for Admac. If we go to the beginning, you're going to find out that it was a way of draining resources from smallholders to fund 
large scale farmers. So if we want to restructure ADMAC, let's give it a pure mandate that it's going to be a profit making entity and not something disguised as a social protection. And a parliamentary committee on agriculture says suspending services of ADMAC is an overreaction and has asked the government to rescind the decision. However, Minister of Agriculture Owe said the government is aware of the importance of ADMAC to local farmers and assured that the organization will be back in operation soon. I am Lamek Masina for VOA News in Blanta, Malawi. listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Friday, September 2nd. And still to come on our program, Samson O'Malley Sports. The United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, says thousands of children in the Horn of Africa and the Sahel could die from severe malnutrition and waterborne diseases. The organization raised the alarm during this year's World Water Week, saying that child mortality is bound to rise dramatically unless measures are taken to address malnutrition in children. Dr. Sam Godfrey is the UNICEF Regional Advisor on Water, Sanitation, Hygiene, and and climate for eastern and southern Africa. He tells viewers Jackson Vonganyi that water scarcity leads to insecurity and especially poses a deadly risk to children in the region. The one of Africa, our report really shows the number of people without reliable access to safe water has risen now to more than 16 million uh, people in the last five months. And of course, as that water becomes scarcer, it also is becoming more expensive. In Mandera, for example, which is an area of Kenya, We've seen a 400% price hike uh, since January 2021 in, in the price of water. And there are various reasons for um, the scarcity of water. Uh, one of them uh, is the um, consecutive failure of five rainfalls. And the second is really in terms of the demographics and the movement um, of population towards areas where there is water, which is, is putting huge pressure on, on already uh, quite limited uh, existing water resources. Now, the number of people with access to clean water in, in countries like Ethiopia had increased in the last decade. W- would you say that there has been a reversal or decline in the progress around access to water in some of these areas? During the Millennium Development Goals, um, up until uh, the period of, of 2015, um, countries like Ethiopia made significant progress in terms of um, getting access to what is considered to be basic uh, water supply. Many of those water systems, however, um, are not very resilient to climatic shocks. They rely on quite low-cost technologies. Often they access quite shallow um, groundwater sources or, or, or riverbeds. And so if there is a failed rain or, or a series of failed rains uh, or a flood, um, these climatic shocks um, are often um, fatal uh, for the resilience of, of, of that infrastructure. How is water access related to other issues affecting, affecting the region right now? Water is critical um, both for ensuring food security uh, but also for avoiding public health outbreaks. Somalia at the moment, due to the scarcity of water, is experiencing outbreaks of acute water diarrhea um, and cholera. 8,200 cases have been reported um, between January and June uh, of this year in Somalia, which is more than double the number from last year. And two-thirds of those are children under, under five. And it's important to, to be clear that this is a, a, you know, a children's emergency and that the, the scarcity of water, of course, is affecting children. And at the moment, 1.8 million children also um, in the you know, of Africa are affected with severe acute malnutrition, which is also significantly higher than last year. Dr. Sam Goffrey is the UNICEF Regional Advisor on Water, Sanitation, Hygiene and Climate for Eastern and Southern Africa. He was speaking with viewers Jackson Vonganyi. 
In Nigeria, there are increasing calls for the country's national petroleum company to produce evidence of its claims that prominent Nigerians, including religious and community leaders and government officials, were stealing crude oil. Chief Executive Officer Mele Kiari said this week that the stolen oil products were being stored in churches and mosques in broad daylight. Kiari said security forces arrested at least 122 people between June and August this year. Reverend Polycarp Baja is a senior pastor of the Strong House Abuja and chair of the Strong Foundation Ministries of Nigeria. He tells me that the oil chief executive Kiari has the responsibility to tell Nigerians the location of the alleged churches and the community leaders and government officials involved. I noticed that um, his claims were not substantiated in any way. First, he said the stolen oil were kept in houses of worship. And um, if you can imagine for a minute, how do you put crude oil in houses of worship? How many people are in that place? If you could imagine what a tanker is that carries oil, how is it possible to hide or to keep stolen fuel in houses of worship? So I saw that there was no substantiation of those claims. In the first place, if you're talking about a daily theft of 20,000 to 200,000 barrels of oil, there's no way they can be kept in such a house of worship. The National Petroleum Company is a government institution. We tried to reach the chief executive officer. We couldn't get him. But has there been any announcement in terms of who are the government officials? No, but I think that that is where they, as the Nigerian National Petroleum Company, they are responsible and should be held accountable for losses of almost half a million barrels daily. That's a lot of money and a lot of loss. And if you are talking about such a strategic loss, then it behoves and is the responsibility of uh, Mele Kiari, who is the uh, GMD, to tell us who those people are. He should tell us also the location of those houses of worship, which he has not yet done. But he mentioned that from April to August 2022, Nigerian authorities arrested at least 122 persons that were involved in this pipeline vandalism and oil theft. Who are those people? He should name those people. When you give figures like this, they should be identified. These are high-profile crimes against the state of Nigeria. You don't hide those people. If they are accused, you will say such people are suspects. You have not named the suspect. You have not identified the exact location of the theft and the storage. So I think that uh, Mr. Mele Kerry owes it as a duty and as the officer who is accountable to the country for that product to tell us who those people are, even if they are suspects. It's so nice to talk with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, James Bloti. Thank you. Reverend Polycarp Baja is a member of the Christian Association of Nigeria. He was speaking with me from Abuja. In Ghana, a 2021 Auditor General's report says 374 academic programs offered at the University of Ghana are not accredited. Local media report said the report, dated June 1, 2022, was addressed to the Speaker of Ghana's Parliament. The report said the university's management has been asked to work with the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission to use retroactive accreditations to cover all the non-accredited certificates that are already issued to students. Kofi Asare is the Executive Director of Africa Education Watch, an education policy think tank. He tells me the via contravenes Ghana's educational regulatory law, which carries a fine of not less than $10,000 and 15 to 20 years imprisonment. Well, I think that as public institutions, and I'm talking about public institutions being the biggest tertiary institutions in the country, our public tertiary institutions are supposed to be uh, the pre-setters, and if you like, role models for other private tertiary institutions. And so our public institutions should be trained to be running programs in accordance to the laws and the regulations governing the mountain of programs in tertiary institutions. And so the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, the agency responsible for approving or accrediting programs and also the institutions. I appreciate that that is a new institution. It was actually 
created through a merger of the National Council for Tertiary Education and the National Accreditation Board. Be that it may, it doesn't give enough excuse or any reason for reputable institutions, some of them being world class, to run programs that have not been accredited by the regulator of the tertiary schools. What are the implications for a university that offers unaccredited college programs? Let's talk about academics first. Well, in terms of the implications, we may look at it from two angles. The first angle is the group of programs that are not new. So there are programs that are ongoing programs, existing programs that need re-accreditation. For those programs, there's nothing serious about it, except that we still must respect the dictator and the laws and the regulations. But there may be programs that are new, new programs that has not been accredited. You cannot assume or predict that it will be accredited just because you have mounted the program, just because you have trained students in the program, and just because you have issued certification. That will not be enough. I have trained students, a couple of students, I think three of them, who pursued programs in Ghanaian University, not public universities do, but then they did unaccredited programs, applied for a PhD program abroad, and then when it came to the confirmation by the regulator that whether or not the programs were accredited, obviously they were not accredited. Kofi Asare is the executive director of Africa Education Watch, an education policy think tank. He was speaking with me from Ghana's capital, Accra. It's time now for Daybreak Africa Sports. And here is Samson O'Malley in Abuja, Nigeria. A very good Friday morning to you, Samson. Good Friday morning to you too, James. We begin the sport in South Africa, where the Council of Southern African Football Associations, COSAFA, Women's Championship got underway on Thursday in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Striker Barbara Banda scored twice as Zambia claimed a hard fought 2 0 victory over Namibia in their championship group B opener at the Nelson Mandela Bay Stadium on Thursday. In the early kickoff on Thursday, Betunielo Rabali scored a hard trick as Lesotho East pass Eswatini with a 3-0 victory in their pool opener to lay down a marker of their potential. It is Lesotho's first win at the competition in five games since the big Namibia 2-1 in 2017. Defending champions Tanzania will begin their campaign when they take on Comoros in Group C at the Madiba Stadium on Friday. Malawi's coaches will hope to turn silver into gold this season and bring their championship with a tough clash against 2020. 22 Afghan Women's Cup of Nations quarter finalist Botswana at the same venue. Staying with women's football news, South Africa national women's football team Banyana Bayana coach Destry Ellis wants her charges to treat their two international friendlies against South American champions Brazil as if they are playing official matches. Banyana Banyana, who won this year's Women's African Cup of Nations, Wafkin, midnight ranked Brazil at Soweto's Orlando Stadium on Friday and Durban's Moses Mabida Stadium on Monday. We have to prepare, we have to get better, we have to make sure we get learnings out of this but we're also here to play you know we're not a team that's just going to um, allow them to play because uh, we've grown as a team over the last four years because they know there are people watching this is an op opportunity for some of them to be scouted this is an opportunity for them to test themselves individually also to see what they need to work on as individuals the royal moroccan football federation has announced the appointment of walid regragri as the new manager of the atlas lions walid regragri took widened to one of the best seasons in their history and his best season as a coach by winning the championship champions league double the contract with the former wider coach is expected to run until 2026 a former top official of the zimbabwe football association has been banned from all football related activities for five years for sexually harassing three female referees fifa announced on thursday Albert Zoya, former Secretary General of ZIFA Referees Committee, was also fined $20,400 by the Ethics Committee of the World Football's governing body. FIFA said in a statement that after careful analysis of the written statements of the victims, Zoya had been found guilty of abusing his position to sexually harass three female ZIFA referees. 
And that's it on Daybreak Africa Sports.